How are you all? Okay. Are you in despair? No. What is the what's what is next to despair? Oregon. What is? Uh, should we talk about the about the strike? Well, the stragglers come in. There may not be any stragglers. Um, no, let's not talk about the strike. So, uh, uh, or or maybe the, we can talk in the shadow of the strike about the. Uh, we were talking about uh, principles of association and. Uh, uh, trying to make a distinction between a fanciful association, uh, which is essentially the product of a private uh, of, of a private connection, uh, stimulated by some experience, and an experience uh, which stimulates an imaginative association. And uh, making a distinction between an imaginative association as stimulated by something which people with different experience would agree uh, would would be prompted to the same association. And the example I used: if you see a bird flying, you may think of freedom or the circumscriptions of freedom, or so, but the uh, the the stimulus is accessible to the response of more than one observer and, and will uh, produce approximately an, an association uh, in reaction to that which is excessive, which would be understandable to a third party. And the distinction I made uh, was with a fanciful association which is purely private. Uh, and uh, I, I, uh, the example I used uh, with a customary facility and uh, delicacy of taste was uh, 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 if I hear uh, the song Runaway by Del Shannon, I think the first of the first time I experienced oral congress from a white girl, that's a private, that's a fanciful association because there's nothing intrinsic in that song that would make someone else think of that. Uh, but uh, the reason that uh, I, I uh, resume our discussion at that point is to suggest to you that uh, as artists, as writers, uh, if we are uh, not going to uh, attempt to discover the principle of organization for our work in uh, some third party's expectation of what ought to organize our work. For example, what are they buying this season? Um, then uh, it is a mistake to disown uh, fanciful associations as possibly being the source for uh, uh, if pursued, these fanciful associations, if pursued uh, as, as being a, a, uh, uh, the means by which we may gain access to a more genuine imaginative association. And the reason that's important is, uh, and I, I think uh, just to hold on for one last second to that, uh, the idea of that old rock and roll song. Um, if you ever go to these uh, oldies concerts or uh, public television when they're trying to do fundraisers because most of the people are near death who watch uh, public television, uh, will often show rock and roll revivals from the 50s. And you see these people who are still, you know, have their the ducktail haircuts and, and and the only thing is for the most part they're in wheelchairs but they're still listening to exactly to say to Danny and the juniors singing at the hop because for them the fanciful association with 
uh, which is a private association with youth, is still so strong. And from that, we can, uh, uh, if, if we're sort of uh, sensitive to the deepest implication of that, it, it, uh, you know, Proust, I don't know how good of a living he made, but, he, but Proust, after all, is uh, uh, still read by some of us. And uh, uh, all of Remembrance of Things Past uh, was suggested to Proust by a fanciful association. The, the Madeline, you know, uh, uh, which I get is some sort of a cookie. Um, isn't that right? Yeah, it's a cookie. Oh, by all means. I thought you were going to paint today. Yeah? Go ahead, sir. Just two? Well, there are a lot more pieces. Okay, all right. Yeah. 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 Well, if you'd shut the fuck up, I'd be, I'm, it was just about to explain it to you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, well, let's get to the second one uh, in in just a minute. But um, w w what I wanted to uh, uh, go on to discuss today is if if we accept as as a given that something in the fanciful. Uh, how, however private for us, is also compelling. For example, uh, wh what is it in uh, these souls who go to these rock and roll, you know, to the revival of Danny and the Juniors? And, you know, there's a whole cottage industry which has developed where everybody's dead in the original group you know, the five satins or whatever it is, but they try and come up with some connection to it. And now with the lead singer who was the third from the next door neighbor to the original lead singer to five satins, here they are. And these doddering figures come out. Um, well, you know, youth and uh, 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 I guess Thoreau said, you know, we, most of us uh, lead lives of quiet desperation. And uh, and the rest of us are incarcerated and spend the time screaming. Um, so, uh, youth uh, and uh, when Danny and the Juniors or uh, others, uh, for those of you who are younger, uh, we associate with a, that with a time when we felt anything was possible. And... Uh, the idea of, for example, decrepitude or the thwarting of ambition or the yielding to the meretricious in one form or another uh, was for somebody else. Um, and the, the symptom of the, 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 the outward manifestation of that association with Danny and the Juniors is merely fanciful. But if you stay with it for a bit and, and let the, 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 the fancy sort of sink its roots down into the commonality of experience, certainly the yearnings of youth, uh, that's an association that uh, uh, is accessible to the imagination of all of us. So uh, what, what I, what I want to suggest to you as writers, because anything that engenders a passionate connection with recollection or with feeling or uh, with image uh, is precious 
to us as a, as a, uh, a motor for engagement. Um, don't turn away immediately from the fanciful. Stick with it and, and uh, see if it isn't possible to accommodate and neutralize what is merely fanciful in the initial association uh, and see what may be underneath. Now to recur to the horribly infelicitous example of uh, thinking of the first time you got a blowjob from a white girl, which you continue to afflict me with every time I see you. Whoa, let me tell you about the first time I got a blowjob from a white girl. Um, the, uh, for me, um, if I stick, if I stick with that, if I say, well, what, 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 why does, what, what holds me in that recollection? Um, well, the corollary of it must be uh, that I'd gotten a little head from uh, an African American, right, or somebody uh, previously, and. And that part I don't remember. Well, I, if provoked, I'll remember it. But but um, but when I hear music, I don't I don't remember that. Well, why is that? Uh, is it possible that uh, the previous experience was associated with uh, oh, Camp Twelve, Thirteen, whatever it is, and I'm so now I go down to the the uh, uh, to William Street in Buffalo, and uh, I'm you know I've got forged uh, ID, and I go in and to the bars, and I listen to BB King. You could BB King used to play there three weeks at a time, twenty five cents a drink, not bad, and in between sets. You know, you'd be out in the alley, and for two dollars, you could get a blowjob from a black girl. Uh, why leave? Why ever leave? Right. <laughs> so, but in recollection, um, somehow memory or association is. Uh, trapped or thwarted or contained. Whereas if, if, if you now, and, and believe me, Runaway is not as good as the worst song that B.B. King ever sang. Um, I remember he, had, he didn't used to like, like to work too hard, and he had a vocalist named Elmo Morris. And uh, now... And the better song, remember, would be uh, "Part Time Love" right, with Elmo Morris singing. But, but hope, as opposed to how, how, however fulfilling the experience was at the Pine Grill, listening to BB King and whatever else was going on in the alleyway, there was something furtive and shamed that associated with that. What am I doing? I used to I used to get caught. My mother was the president of the Board of Education, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, I used to get uh, arrested a little bit down there. Uh, and uh, and they, does your mother know where you are? Because what the cops are thinking is this is a bad arrest for me to make. I don't want to be doing this, you know. So they'd kick you in the ass, you know, and. Um, Shame is a tremendous cloaker of, of imaginative association. Um, even though the song isn't as good, Runaway, uh, now I suspect that w what I really remember is thinking, oh, well, uh, the act of intimacy does not have to be uh, cloaked in shame. Nah, it does. Yeah, it does. Um, 
and, but but that sort of f uh, a flicker of optimism that what one is doing at the moment need not be uh, contradicted by subsequent experience. Maybe you could fall in love. Maybe in recollection for us as artists, you have an a, there becomes available to you an uninterrupted sequence of associations, which, if followed out, may ultimately generate the premise for a story, for the structure of a story, which the initial seemingly fanciful association precludes. Um, that's why it, it, it's it's uh, what you what you try to do is, as the gentleman was asking me, what does that mean to accommodate and neutralize what is initially fanciful in the association? Now, as I communicated that to you, um, why would I be uh, uh, hurtful or uh, vulgar enough to say, "Oh, it makes me think of the first time I got a blowjob from a white girl"? There's two or three offensive elements in that, and uh, for which I uh, apologize with no great conviction, but, um, but uh, there, let, let's, let's think of lines intersecting. So here's Dave's uh, recollected experience, but here am I talking to you. Now how do I vitalize uh, how do I give an, uh, an emotional impact to the idea of a private or fanciful association? I throw you back on yourselves. I'm talking about an experience of mine, and I'm trying to bring you to understand what may be private and, and not properly the subject for, say, a series, for a story. So simultaneous with my generation of the setting, which is available to everybody, oh yeah, I remember being 12 years old, I remember sex and everything, I offend you and I throw you back from the moment and that vitalizes the abstract idea of what is fanciful, of what is private. Oh, geez, what's the matter with him? You know, what's he got to say that for? You know, we're talking about art here, and now he's talking about he's being a bigot, he's being all this other shit. I'm not like that. Um, the tactics of fictive persuasion uh, are multiple and simultaneous. And... Um, the uh, in the process of being true to uh, the report of the experience, I am also aware, and this is the point at which these two intentions intersect, of your being at the beginning of understanding of what I'm trying to tell you. So my first task is... Uh, to get you to be interested in my experience. And simultaneously, I want to put you off a little bit so that when I then talk about, for example, Paul uh, and suggest what is purely imaginative in the sequence of images which he presents about charity, uh, uh, and, and so on, and the cumulative effect of those, the pure, uh, uh, the, the, the outflow of emotion, which is not profaned in any way by what is private or fanciful, is what generates the full participation of your imagination. And that's what makes him such a good writer. Now, the, the um, okay, does that... My, my pleasure. That might be a little strong, but uh, uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I was speaking of pleasure. Not, uh, um, now, 
if, if, if we're talking about a story and uh, uh, I, I think I, I might have mentioned that uh, uh, my, uh, my teacher, uh, the p person who taught me so much about writing, uh, although I, I wasn't prepared to learn most of what he had presented for years and years afterwards, but uh, uh, there's a poem in, in uh, uh, which concludes, a poem of his concludes, Tell me a story in a moment and century of mania. Tell me a story. Make it a story of great distances and starlight. The name of the story will be time, but you must never say its name. Tell me a story of deep delight. Now, uh, that, uh, um, although the tactics of that concluding section of the poem are imagistic, um, at, at, at the level of form, in terms of, it, of its content, um, the, that is an exhortation to the act of pure imagination as the deepest fulfillment of the human spirit. Tell me a story is the goal. And the reason is in a moment and century of mania. Tell me a story. So let's call mania fancy. Because fancy can be, for example, uh, if you're not a member of the temple, then you need to be killed. That's what Paul was prepared, and same guy that, that wrote the New, New Testament. Uh, if given to mania, would be capable of the most horrible and fundamental transgression of one spirit upon another. Uh, make it a story of great distances and starlight uh, is a way of saying that the counter for fancy, the, the path to the truly imaginative, is to identify a premise which is large and encompasses not only space, but time. How long does it take starlight? You see, you see what I'm saying? Um, the name of the story will be time because it is over what we perceive as time that the apprehension, the experience of distances and, and starlight derives its meaning for us. Um, but you must never say its name, which is to say that um, you know the Grand Inquisitor in, in Ivan's dream and the brothers Karmazov uh, says that uh, Christ brought man a message of freedom, but man requires miracle, mystery, and authority, and the Church gives him that. And in that tension, you as, then that was why the Grand Inquisitor was justifying crucifying Christ again there in Spain. Um, you must never say its name is, I, I think, therefore, uh, the, the story itself, storytelling, the submission to the story, is as close as we can get to God without coercive structure. And it's coercive structure, whether it's in the temple in Jerusalem or uh, a or CSI, or uh, which is to say a, a a commitment to form as having an intrinsic authority, rather than emerging naturally from imaginative association. 
that ultimately generates mania and murder of one kind or another, that forestalls the development of the spirit. Uh, so the name of the story will be time, but you must never say its name. Tell me a story of deep delight. And uh, w if we return to the original horribly offensive image of, you know, the song of Runaway and, and so on, um, we're able to neutralize and accommodate everything which is fanciful and simply reside with that sense of original possibility that even the 70-year-old man with the ducktail haircut recollects when anything was possible and uh, which contains within itself uh, that seed of hope which first expressed itself, you know, in the generation of the universe. All right, pal? <laughs> um, so, uh, now, I, I had threatened uh, in carrying on from, uh, uh, you know, in, in identifying, in, in chronicling, uh, you know, the fanciful associations that I had with the idea of the racetrack. Uh, the, uh, and how, if one were to pursue the premise of the story as set at a racetrack, but to neutralize what is fanciful, private, in my experience, and to see whether there remains, once those have been accommodated and neutralized, the, whether the passion remains that could generate a story over the course of time, or, or whether it is in my fanciful associations that my uh, uh, deep connection to the materials is found and, and which would not therefore sustain me unless you know I had a commitment from ESPN or some other bullshit. Um, and uh, we went on then to discuss what is universal in the artifacts of that, what may be universal in the artifacts of that world. Now, uh, so if what was fanciful and private was a, uh, uh, for, for me, a, a kind of obsessive uh, identification with, a uh, authority which victimized me, but to which victimization I blinded myself as a way of, uh, of uh, coexisting with what I took to be a given reality. Is that sufficiently obscure for you? Um, in other words, uh, and, and so for years, uh, there was simply a seed image in my mind as I tried to write a story set at the racetrack, which was hands paying money through a wire screen. And I couldn't see whose hands they were. And I used to think to myself, if I could only see whose hands those were, I would know what's going on. Now, uh, uh, over the cor and uh, over the course of years, you know, uh, I would fixate on that moment and just write about it. But the extraordinary thing for us as writers, you know, is that you come up with all kinds of ways of distracting yourself from the fact that you don't really want to write about this. So, uh, sometimes uh, it would be, uh, well, there's no electricity in the apartment. So what I have to do is, I have to work out a way to run an elect uh, uh, a plug from some hallway outlet in here so I can turn the lights on. That's a matter of a day or two. And uh, uh, simultaneously, you gotta avoid the landlord right? 
and maybe you're under such stress from that that you got a cop two or three times. Uh, you can make a whole life out of that. Uh, but uh, all the time telling yourself, geez, if I could only figure out uh, whose hands those were. Now, as it turns out, over years, it, it would come to me that the hands were just the hands of the teller, of the guy, and it was what was going, it was the people who were sitting at the table just out of my field of vision that it was about, and it didn't matter whether they were at the racetrack or some other place. That's how the psyche protects itself. Uh, unless it has a mechanism for the benign accommodation of what may be painful in recollection. Um, and the uh, and and once uh, through whatever sequence of imaginative developments, you're able to see what it is that that the fixation on the hands has been allowing you to avoid, it's got nothing to do with the racetrack. Um, but I spent a lot of time learning about the racetrack in order to avoid seeing who was at that table. Uh, there are bookmakers who gather at annual conventions to celebrate the amount of energy and attention I gave to learning about gambling in, in the absolutely misdirected hope that I would figure out whose hands those were. Um, let me uh, 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 digress for a moment so you don't think this is a, an endless story about the racetrack. Um, and go back to a poem of my teacher's. Uh, by way of suggesting uh, uh, what one eventually comes to if, if you believe in the process of art uh, as uh, uh, cleansing and redemptive. Um, there's a poem uh, uh, Mr. Warren's called... Uh, uh, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. And uh, if my faculties weren't in such a state of accelerated deterioration, I would have remembered to bring it um, and read it to you. But uh, the poem begins with a recollection of uh, the poet recall, I, I think the poem begins, no, not that door, never and continues with, uh, but entering, saw. And the poet has gone up in the house, uh, into the attic of the house where he lived as a child and, and, uh, and sees a Christmas tree of uh, its leaves long since denuded. It's evidently a tree that's 60 years old. And uh, if we take that tree as an equivalent, of, say, of the hands, uh, uh, dispensing the, those disembodied hands, uh, and the poet's reluctant to look away from the tree, but finally does and sees sitting in two rocking chairs uh, two uh, figures, uh, one of whom he, uh, uh, closer scrutiny reveals, uh, has no eyes, uh, and whose skin has rotted away. And uh, one of them is his mother, uh, dead now for 30 or 40 years, and the, the other is his father. And their eyes stare 
at uh, what what would have been their eyes stare at what eyes would have seen if I still could see. And uh, 